Welcome, my name is Kelly Anderson and this is Fanimated, the animation fan podcast where we get a chance to geek out about our favorite animated media. Jamie Krause is joining me today to talk about Kubo and the Two Strings. This stop motion animation film by Leica was voted on by our Patreons. You can vote for upcoming episode topics by going to www.patreon.com slash fanimated. Jamie and I have a lot to discuss, so spoiler warnings for those who haven't seen the movie, and let's get started and let's get animated. Hey Jamie, thanks so much for joining me, how are you? Good, thank you. Also, hi Kelly. This is great, I can't wait to talk about this movie. Oh, me neither. I'm so excited. Um, uh, Kubo in the Two Strings is a film by Leica Studios. They do a whole bunch of stop motion animation awesomeness. And, you know, I think this one, after watching it, rewatching it again, I think, I think it's hard to like really say definitively, but I'm pretty sure Kubo in the Two Strings is my favorite Leica film. Oh, boy. Ooh, that that's tough. Um, <laughs> I I kind of feel bad because I haven't actually gotten around to seeing um, Box Trolls, but I've seen the other <gasps> ones, and I remember yeah. Paranorman in particular was like just so much better than I thought it could possibly be. That was absolutely wild. Um, I would one hundred percent agree. Yeah, yeah, and then the second half of that movie got so much more like profound and emotional than I thought it would be. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Oh, that's such a good one. That's definitely yeah. up there. And honestly, Box Trolls is my close second. So you need to watch Ooh, okay. Box Trolls because it's um, up there in my list of favorite Leica films. Oh, I got to see that at some point. <laughs> yes, you do. I'm not a huge fan of like Coraline. Um, it's just not my mm -hmm. jam. But I know a lot of people really love Coraline. And of course, Leica did that as well. I think was that their was that their first one? Um, that was yeah, that was their first feature. Was was mm -hmm. Coraline the first one they did? Okay, yeah. Um, and a lot of people really love it, and uh, it definitely has a good following. It's a good film, absolutely. Just not uh, not up my alley. <laughs> yeah, I can get that too. Mm -hmm. It's got a very specifically weird kind of creepy, almost like a little bit of a Tim Burton feel. I don't know. Or the early Tim Burton, at least. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it does. And they did Corpse Bride, which was Tim Burton. So they are like into oh, the Oh, there you go. Shoot, yeah, I forgot yeah. about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Huh. Um, I just recently rented Missing Link, their most recent film. I was not impressed, actually. <laughs> I completely um, forgot that movie existed, honestly. <laughs> Well, and like the animation is still obviously super gorgeous and if you're a fan of stop motion animation, definitely watch it, but I would say like the characters and the story didn't quite land. Like I could tell what they were trying to do, but they just didn't get there. They did way too much telling and not enough showing. You know what I mean? Oh, really? Okay. Yeah, I was like, okay, so you're telling me that um, this person is like uh, changing his ways and being a better care person, uh, but you're not really showing me examples of how he has changed, you know? Hmm, okay. So, didn't quite land. But Kubo and the Two Strings, coming back around, definitely does land. Like, their character development is amazing. They, they hit the story and all the right marks, and just, it makes this amazing, phenomenal film that I can't wait to talk about. I have, I have three pages of notes here, and, like, a lot of them are just things like, this song is really dope. Oh, no, this part was amazing. Like... I started out with good intentions, but I mostly just have a list of me saying, wow. <laughs> well, that's how I feel when I watch this in film. I'm just like, wow, wow. And then, ouch, my heart, it hurts. <laughs> oh, 100%. I remember, um, I, I think when I looked it up yesterday, I think it said summer 2016. And I think 
at that point, I was, um, it was before I moved to my apartment that I was in for like a good three, three and a half years. So it was when I was, I was living in a house for only like a single month and it was just a really, uh, there was a lot going on and there was a lot of uncertainty and things were changing a whole lot and I had to figure out like job situation, house situation, tons of stuff. And I went and saw this movie, um, by myself in the theater and there was literally no one else there because <laughs> it wasn't like opening night or anything. And it wasn't, it wasn't even a super popular movie. Like it wasn't something everyone was talking about, you know? So I was literally the only person in the theater. Like when I went into the movie, when I was thinking about, oh, maybe I'll go see it. It looks good. I guess I don't really know what I was expecting. Like, oh, it's going to be this cool, weird fantasy stop motion uh something or other and then i see it and the story they tell through this animation is so incredibly sad it's just so heartbreaking especially towards the end and that caught me off guard completely and there's there's so many specific things about that i don't even know where to start oh absolutely just the emotional depth and resonancy of this film is absolutely unbelievable. So before we get any further, again, if you have not seen this film, stop right now, go watch it, and come back, okay? <laughs> I'm about to spoil everything. Do it. <laughs> if do, you're, it do it, do it. If you're still here and you haven't seen it, uh, Kubo and the Two Strings is about um, a boy named Kubo who lives with his mother, and she is always telling him stories of his father, the great Hanzo, who was this great samurai warrior, and um, telling him that he can't go out at night because his grandfather, the Moon King, will come and steal his other eye because when he was a baby, his eye was uh, stolen by his grandfather. And, of course, he does stay out at night, and then uh, his aunts, the really creepy uh, uh <laughs> warrior aunts <laughs> come after him and <clears throat> basically he ends up hanging out with this monkey and this beetle trying to find the <laughs> <laughs> three uh pieces of armor uh what is it the sun armor or something yeah oh i don't even remember to be honest they're called something but yeah <laughs> I forget what they're called. Um, but these three pieces of armor in order to protect himself against the Moon King. And they just go on this uh, absolutely breathtaking journey. And it is beautiful and perfect and wonderful. <laughs> it it really could not be more different from the other Leica films specifically. Because at least as far as I can think of, two of them are about... A relatively modern kid getting into a weird like coming of age story with relatively modern stuff happening um one of them is about trolls and one of them is about uh some sort of neanderthal person um so having a like this is 100 percent like like a high fantasy epic type thing and that is totally different for them so it was so interesting to see their style of stop motion and like all the care they put into every movie it was so cool to see that translated into a mostly serious, um, mostly, like, with this setting, you can't go for a lot of pop culture references or super modern jokes, so it was very interesting to see them put their style onto a kind of story that is, like, by definition, much more dramatic, much more, um visually crazy, like, with landscapes and journeys and stuff like that, and I absolutely loved it. Absolutely. And again, it is so different to the others. Just, I mean, not all of them cover like supernatural things, but I mean, I guess this could maybe fall under a supernatural category. Um, but, yeah. but it definitely has a dark tone. But then again, all of them have pretty dark tones if you're thinking about it. Yeah, that is true. That is absolutely true. Um, now that I think about it, yeah, they're all pretty dark. Honestly, I think maybe Box Trolls is the least of which that are dark. But even then, it's like the guy is trying to kill all of the trolls. It's pretty sad. Anyway, but there definitely is something about this one that sticks out from the rest. And I think you, yeah, hit it on the head. Like it's uh, 
more of like a high fantasy sort of adventure and like uh in this whole other time and place and they just they they do such a good job of setting the scene you know and making you feel like you're in this and it's so wonderful one of my favorite parts of uh the scenery one of my favorite parts of just like how everything looks visually is there's a whole stretch of the movie where they're wandering through um this giant snowy wasteland and there's just these giant statues that have crumbled and toppled over and you never get even a single word about why they're there you just you just wonder they're just kind of there no one talks about them and they move on like it's so weird because it makes you immediately think like what what happened here like what is what used to be here and you kind of just get to wonder because that's just a part of the world absolutely yeah there's so many really cool details like that and um they put so much all of their films it just they put so much detail and effort into every little thing that you just really can feel part of the world and this is really great too because this is the first stop motion animation that we've talked about and just like in 3d animation they have to build everything inside of the computer well these people are like building everything in real life they are crafting actual little costumes actual towns and buildings and scenery they're like putting together all of these puppets it is absolutely fascinating and just the amount of detail and work that goes into all of it just like makes my jaw drop and I it it makes this fantastical beautiful story even more like uh awe-inspiring because there's so much pure magic in how they put it together and how it actually comes to be it just makes me so excited and happy and I'm and I love it so much (laughs) It almost it almost doesn't seem possible. Like like you try to describe it to someone like, okay, so what they do is they have these little figures and they take pictures of them and then they move them tiny bits at a time and they take more pictures of them and then they put them all together and make a movie. And like that doesn't even sound real, you know? That sounds <laughs> that sounds like it would take well, I mean it does take years obviously, but it sounds yeah. like it would take impossibly long to even get started and that's why I don't know. There, like you said, there's something so impressive about that amount of work. Um, obviously, all films are difficult to make, but there is something. Uh, there's something particularly special about like knowing that each frame had to be carefully planned and how how everything was moved and designed, and it's just absolutely wild. This is a weird place to start um, to start with specific examples, but at the very end of the film, during the credits, there is there's a moment where it goes away from what it had been doing from the credits with like cool concept art and uh the fun little 2d designs and every all the names in the credits going past and it suddenly switches to the real footage of the giant skeleton monster like the actual prop thing sitting there in the middle of a room and everyone is around it working on it and it's so crazy to watch because it's huge. It's bigger than a person. And they're just, like, doing tiny little touch-ups with their tools, and they're moving bits of it, like, one way or another. And you suddenly realize, like, oh, this was a part of the movie I just watched. This was real. They built this, and they had to move it and and bring it to life in almost a literal way because that was how they made the film. It's so bizarre to think about. Especially getting that that very real, very visual, um, seeing it right in front of you with real people walking around it is so weird. (laughs) But it really just brings the whole thing together and makes you realize, like, this is how this film was created. This is how stop motion works. And there's something so cool about watching that. Yes, I... I absolutely love all of the time-lapse videos that Leica does, and I will put some up on the Patreon. You don't have to be a Patreon supporter to see them. I'll just put them up there for you to see. Um, Just watch some of these. It is crazy how much work goes into moving them each little tiny bit. And Leica does put some of those time-lapses at the ends of their credits just to kind of show and they're always super cool um 
And this is a great place to start with the animation in general. So I'm just going to dive into it. Jamie, I literally just, that's For all sure. I have. I have so much to say about this animation and how it's done. <laughs> you, you mentioned the um, giant skeleton monster. Okay, so let's start yes. there. <laughs> skeleton so, monster. Yeah, they... Um, Beetle, Monkey, and Kubo uh, fight the skeleton monster in order to find the sword unbreakable. And (laughs) the skeleton just looks so huge. It towers over them. And that's because it actually does. So Kubo's puppets are six inches tall. So to put in perspective, uh, just keep, keep in mind that Kubo is six inches tall. The skeleton <laughs> is 16 feet tall. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness. Yeah. So in yeah. real life, they made this giant, giant puppet. It's 400 pounds. It oh, has my a tw- goodness. It has a 22-foot arm span. <laughs> See, I did not know that. Uh, and, that's terrifying. Yeah. So Leica claims, and I believe this is probably true, it's the largest stop motion puppet ever. Wow. <laughs> um and oh my it's goodness. held Yeah, it's held together by magnets and they designed a robot, and you can see it in that time lapse video at the end of the film. They designed this robot to be able to easily manipulate it so that, you know, they can move little bits at a time and and without having to fully, you know, move this giant, giant thing. Um, And oh my goodness, I just think that is so cool and crazy and how and what. (laughs) The fact that it exists is, is terrifying. And I'm not saying it's definitely out there waiting to attack me at some point, but it might be. Uh, it exists in the world. It's a real thing. So, it's true. Have fun with those nightmares. Uh, when it actually shows up in the film, like when they first see it, is so cool because uh, at first you just see the eyes, and then as the camera moves a little bit, you realize that it's not in front of them. It's like above them, and it's so high above them, and they're just—they <laughs> suddenly realize that they're in trouble. <laughs> It's it's such a good moment of suddenly realizing the scale of not only this scene, but like what the whole movie is capable of. So just to um, help people picture this if they don't know um, how stop motion works. But so you're, we're talking about these puppets. We're talking about these things, these sets. It really is like a miniature uh, film set, like a live action film set. So they have That's their, a good way to think about it, yeah. Yeah, it's just miniature. So they have the lights and the the sets and the stage and the green screen in the background and honestly you'd be surprised with how uh how much isn't green screen, like <laughs> how much they they actually build. They they built that entire village. They built those trees like they built everything but they you know then they have green screen and all of that so um they use like little bits of wire and little bits of like um string and other things to move these little individual parts bit by bit by bit um and so not only do they have these animators who are doing that and changing these pieces little by little but they have everyone who builds everything. They have the set designers and the costumers and the, uh, you know, puppeteers and people who make all of the puppets. Um, the puppet fabrication department has like 50 to 60 artists and craftspeople um, of different skills that build the wigs and the molds and the costumes and the armature um and the armature is like a metal skeleton so that allows the puppet to stand upright and hold a pose and do all those things so um uh there's all these little ways that they can manipulate the puppet and the face oh the face that's a whole other thing um not only does each character have multiple puppets like they build different um bodies for them but they also build tons of different faces um so they 
Yes, so they will take the faces on and off the puppet as they go. And in one single shot of Kubo and the Two Strings, there's a 27 second shot of a character and it uses 250 unique faces for one character for 27 <laughs> seconds on screen. That is that... <laughs> that uh, that's hard to imagine. I That is yeah, it wow. is. It is hard to imagine. That is the scale at which they're working. And I've seen some stuff like behind the scenes stuff. They just have this huge storage space with drawers and drawers and drawers of faces of these puppets. <laughs> A well, little bit that scary. Way, it sounds terrifying. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it does. Oh man. Yeah. Um, so to to craft a single puppet from start to finish takes like three to four months. Um, but once it's finished, then they can make the duplicates more easily. So think about how much work is going just into creating the puppet, let alone moving it, right? And um, right. a prince, a principal character can have up to 28 full body puppets. So 28 full body puppets, hundreds and hundreds of faces. Uh, it's it's insane. Um, for the clothing, they often will have um, little pieces of wire and things in the clothing too so that they c- can make the clothing move as if it's, you know, being blown by the wind or you know it's the same with like their hair like I you know noticed a lot in this film too like how their hair moves or and like all of those pieces are done individually by the animator it is insane and the costumes have like little tiny weights in them so that it like you know has a more natural sense of gravity and it's just all these little things um and something I didn't even think about until I was researching this is that, like, they have to use special, like, protection on the puppets because they're being handled so much and they're in, uh, like, they're in the stage lighting, their set lighting so much that's like, they have to protect it from where, um, lighting, from the lighting and from, like, being touched and handled so much, which is crazy. How, how do they do that? They, like, yeah, just using, like, stiffeners and, like, fabric protector and, like, all these things huh. to, you know. And I'm sure they do touch-ups on things, like, you know, artistic paints or something to touch things up once oh, in a while. Oh, yeah, for sure. I bet. Um, I always just wonder, like, how do they get through this? I, I, I'm sure mistakes happen. Like, how <laughs> – could you imagine, like, doing, like, a, a very intense, like – session of this and then all of a sudden realizing like you missed a frame like what do you do (laughs) oh no yeah they must be i mean i'm sure they have very very specific plans laid out and storyboards and like every single shot is very specifically like recorded out um it's like very i'm sure it's very scientific because they have to like get it right you know (laughs) For Kubo and the Two Strings, it took them roughly 18 months to create all of the unique locations um, and sets for this. Because they do. They travel to many locales, and they had to build all of those places. Um, And, okay, they made three different boats the like the leaf boat that they <laughs> Wait, go really? across the lake. Yeah, they made three of them. Okay. And it again, I'll put this on the Patreon website so people can see www.patreon.com slash fanimated. Okay. You it, the boats were huge. They like show how they're moving. <laughs> and the person yeah. is like standing in the middle of the boat and it's like it's like it's like the inside of the boat was taken out so you can stand like in it right and he's standing up okay and it's, and it's like set i don't even know how to describe how big it is like i'll just put it on the patreon wow okay like it is crazy how big the boat is uh, and they made three of them okay and each one <laughs> like they used real leaves and real sticks and stuff okay so it took two hundred and forty five thousand four hundred and fifty leaves each Okay, this is insane. How? <laughs> oh. Uh, 
wait, okay, wait a minute. Hold on. When you say they use real leaves, how how does that work? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if they like made leaves out of leaves you know what i mean so they made them smaller or like what if they just like cut out like the leaf like a little paper like stamp or something you know um but they used real natural materials for it so that's awesome yeah it's pretty cool because i was i was thinking about the i was thinking about the skeleton and stuff i was not even considering the ship that didn't that didn't register to me at all that they actually had to build that. Yeah, wow. they did. It's insane. The other the other specific thing that blows my mind when looking at this film and looking at the details. Again, this it's just so crazy and awesome that these people put so much so much in of of themselves into this work and so many details. It's like on this whole other level. I love it so much. But what's really interesting and what I really watched for this time were the sisters, the um, Kubo's aunts. Yeah. Their costumes and the way they move, the way their capes move is insane. Okay, so ready? I've blown your mind like so many times already, but I'm going to blow your mind again. Ready? Okay, let's do it. The, just on the capes alone, okay? Their, the underlining armature for the cape so they could move them had 18 custom miniature rivets that were so small that they had to be made with a surgical needle. <laughs> okay, okay. That's how small we're wow. talking. There are 1,898 wire knots used to hold the armature wire in place to the cape. Oh. What? <laughs> Okay. Each of them are made up of 616 individual feathers, each one a unique <laughs> shape that can only fit into its specified place. What? What? It's not even like they're copy and pasting these feathers. They had to make each feather very specific. What? what? And so, because they're all so specific, it takes th- it took 3 days. For an entire team to apply the feathers. Oh, yeah, I believe it. I mean... <laughs> so, Man. just to just to create the capes, okay? Just to create them, it t- took like 100 hours total per cape for the feather feathers and application and painting of the capes. Wow. That doesn't seem physically possible. It doesn't, but they do it. <laughs> they did it. <laughs> It's so crazy. <sighs> it blows my mind. Jeez. And it's yeah. all of these things that you don't even think about when you're watching the film because you're just like enraptured into the story and and then you sit back and think about wait, wait, how do they do this? Magic. They yeah, sold their yeah. souls. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's man. that's the real story behind this whole operation. That's that's what their next movie should be about. <laughs> <laughs> It's true. Oh my goodness. Yeah, like how? Wow. Um, so I have so much admiration and respect for Laika and uh, I, I and anyone else who does stop motion animation. It is absolutely insane and well done. Yeah. Bravo. Just like just artistically speaking, every single one of their films is phenomenal. But then you take into account the story and the characters and the music and what's actually what, yeah. what what they're actually portraying through this medium it's like what <laughs> insane so let's get into that good good story and good good characters eh? yeah really quick really quick before that um when you were talking about like what's what is it's so incredible like what the studio has been able to do i kind of thought of it a little bit while i was watching this time it's really cool how they're careful to bill these movies as, like, mainly they want to shine the spotlight on their whole studio, you know, on everyone, including the designers, like, all the different uh, all the different jobs that you mentioned that I didn't even know about before this, um, where it seems that, like, 
a lot of films it's a lot of films it's easier to just be like oh that's a that's a film by this lead actor or that's a film by this director and a lot of the a lot of the credit ends up going to one or two people and it's super cool to see how all of these people's time and all of their work goes into this huge project and they have to accomplish so much and it's really cool that uh that Leica specifically is still making sure to give that credit to everyone you know and when people know about these movies, they know them as Leica projects. Like, they know that there's a ton of different people who are all responsible for it. And that's really neat, I think, because they absolutely deserve it. Absolutely. And that's one of my favorite things about animation in general, not just stop motion animation, but just how many people it really takes to put these things together and how many different yeah, definitely. skills and different artistic abilities need to be able to, like, uh, come together to create these things and with Leica specifically it's just very easy to see how much work and effort goes into animation and and honestly the same amount of effort goes into computer animation or 2d traditional animation and it's just something about stop motion that really like gets you thinking about that and like really really uh is admirable yeah, I think so. Especially since it's 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 easier to like, it's easier to visualize maybe uh, to picture people actually working on it because there are real physical things that they have to move around and and mess with. And with computer animation, it's a little more abstract, I guess. Like, yeah, I I can't really picture what exactly an artist will do for a computer animated film. I know it has something to do with designing software, um, but I couldn't tell you what they actually do. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. I love how they um I love how they have like when Kubo starts running away at the beginning, he runs into town where everyone's gathered for the party and the big festival. And from the way it was set up, for some reason in my brain, I thought they were going to have him be like, "Oh no, you have to run. There there's something bad coming." And I thought people were like not going to believe him. I don't know mm-hmm. why I thought that, but it was such a crazy reversal of that when they just they just explode into the town and destroy everything and it's just like oh well the town is gone it's just gone this is how our story starts i guess like it was just wild yeah and then you think again about how they built this whole village probably at least twice because they built the nice village and then they built the village again when it's like all destroyed I really, really love how this entire film, like, is set up. I love both, like, the intro and, like, that false beginning and then also the introduction of Kubo and his mother. Like... Oh, absolutely, yeah. I love how, you know, he just starts off telling the story because, of course, Kubo is a a storyteller and that's, like, one of my favorite parts about him is that he, Mm -hmm. you know... He saves the day, not through the armor, but through his storytelling. But also, um, just how the Okay, you just dropped that really casually, and I honestly don't think I had thought of it that way. And I'm going to need a second, because um, that kind of got... uh, Oh, boy. You're right, though. Jeez. Yeah, let's get into that real quick. Um... (laughs) Yeah, he he spends the whole film getting his the getting the armor so he can protect himself against the Moon King. But in the end, instead of reaching for his sword, he reaches for his uh, what's his instrument yeah. called? His shemison. Uh, I'm pronouncing that wrong. It, it's his guitar thingy. Um, I mean, and I've been thinking of it as a guitar this whole time, but uh, apparently that is incorrect. So I can't help you there. I don't know. It is a. S H A M I S E N. So if you know how to pronounce that, that's what oh, that okay. is. But it, it's a string instrument like a guitar, except it's played with like a, a big pick, and it's like I don't right. know if it's they're all th- three stringed, but that's the one Kubo has. Anyway, so he reaches for his gu- guitar, and I'm just gonna call it a guitar. His instrument in- instead of his sword, and he is like he he you know Kubo knows what's uh, worth, you know, living on Earth for because, you know, his grandfather doesn't understand, like, 
human compassion and is just like, right, right. why would you want to be here where they're suffering? And Kubo is like, well, for every like suffering, there's like these great, great things that are totally worth it. And um, like, it's his power that brings back these memories of the people that everyone is like uh, celebrating the lives of. And so he's, you know, protecting the village and protecting the people. Um with like the memories and stories that like everyone tells each other and i mean that's the whole theme of the whole thing is just like how you know stories live on and um with his parents because again spoiler warning his parents die at the end and he it is it absolutely it just wrecks me that scene because he um you know has to you know has that final like blast of magic and it does he then he's just like left alone and like it's so heart-wrenching and terrible and it's so real and so deep i can't even at some point oh it's when monkey and beetle are talking and again spoilers the monkey is his mother and the beetle is his father um (laughs) yeah don't don't question it it's fine (laughs) don't don't question it it's fine it makes sense it's beautiful and cute and adorable um (laughs) and the beetle is asking the monkey about like why didn't you tell him that you're his mom sooner and stuff and all these things and the beetle is the monkey's like well i'm gonna die soon and you know, because his mother's magic is fading, all this stuff, and um, the beetle's like, well, you'll continue to live on through him, because you'll live in the stories he tells, and then they will tell those stories to people, and then those people will tell stories, you know, and it just goes on and on. Um, So, anyways, that is my, um, my analysis of, you know, Kubo saves the day through stories and compassion and memories and not through uh violence right and that that's such a that's such a i mean to be honest i'm 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 really a sucker for stories where like uh humanity and being a fragile mortal human who is not perfect and will die like stories where that is seen as such a good thing and you remember that that is like the whole point of what makes your life special stories where that comes into focus i just i just absolutely love even though it's not the most brand new unique idea out there but they do it so well oh they do it's it's like you said when when you were talking about how his grandpa doesn't understand why why would anyone choose a life with suffering and tragedy and imperfect things and there's all these really creepy moments about like you could live among the stars you will be immortal and like there's something so inhuman about that there's something so unnatural about that because like without the possibility of things ending and things being less than perfect you kind of get the you get the impression from what he's talking about that like it would just be this cold unfeeling nothingness where like technically everything is perfect but there's nothing worth living for you know so when you have that conflict when you have those two different um worldviews coming together it makes perfect sense that the way kubo uh resolves that problem is instead of with these like magical mythical weapons but like you said it's with his music instead it's with the stories he tells and is with the people of the village who are just regular people who live lives and tell each other stories and will die someday and have like ancestors that they that they pray to but they don't always get to see and have people that they miss but they can't bring back and just regular people and it's so tough to watch that because <laughs> Because, like you said, his parents are both dead. Like, we watched them die, unfortunately. And you kind of have to keep going on anyway. You kind of have to finish the movie. And you have to, like, keep thinking about these really difficult themes. Even though so much tragedy has happened. Man, the, uh, the actual death scene itself is so wild to me. Because I think they did a very good job 
of making you think, okay, here's what's going to happen. Monkey already said that she doesn't have long to live. She already has, like, like a bad uh, wound from the fight. And Beetle is holding her in his arms. So, like, you pretty much have it spelled out for you that Monkey is going to die. Beetle is going to have to carry on her legacy of taking care of Kubo. And the two of them are going to have to figure out how to do this together without her. Even though she's been, like, the leader and the, the comforting presence and the one who kind of keeps them under control. And you are so sure that's what's going to happen that when Beetle dies, you're just so caught off guard that it feels like your entire understanding of the story is just thrown out, out the window. Because all of a sudden, it's just Kubo. Like, he's the only one left. And it's just no Kubo and his two strings. Yeah. <laughs> and the two strings. I absolutely <laughs> lost my mind when I finally... Like when I was watching it the first time, and I finally realized what those what that meant. I oh, I love that! So That's the silly. best feeling. It's the best feeling yeah. when you're like reading a book or watching a movie, and you're like, "Why is it titled this?" And then you get to the point where you know yeah. why it's titled that, and you just like die inside. It's so good. Yeah, this definitely oh my an amazing feeling, and this movie it does a good job with it. After they both die, and Kubo is left on his own, it's it's so. It's such a strange feeling to watch because I think up until that point, you kind of got a sense that you know where the story is going and you still kind of know what's going to happen. Like, obviously, he has to go confront his grandfather, but him being all alone and him having lost his parents again, it feels like such a different part of the story that when the end of the fight comes around and you realize those themes are still there, it just makes it all the more satisfying and all the more heartfelt. Because even though the two people he loves the most have gone, there's still, like, there's still that hope of the story continuing, you know? And those themes of uh, moving on and still being human, even in the face of something that seems impossible to overcome. And that's yes. real sad. That's just real. That's sad. That is sad, and I love it, and it makes me sad. It is sad. It's sad. This movie is sad. But you know what Kubo says at the end? It's my favorite, one of my favorite lines. He says, his whole, well, his whole speech at the end, his final prayer to his parents is absolutely beautiful. But he says, this was a happy story, but it still could have been a whole lot happier or something like that. Like, That's so brutal. It's so hard because he's just grateful he had a chance to meet them both. Yeah. And, you know, spend time with them both. And uh, when he's like, and eat a meal sitting between you, like that part when they're actually eating and, you yeah. know, he's, you know, Beetle's like, what's wrong? And have you never, you know, had him? He's joking, like, have you never had a meal sitting between a beetle and a monkey? And he's like, I've never sat between, I had a meal sitting between anyone before. And that whole yeah. thing was like, oh, it just wrecks me. Like, this whole journey is so, they have these fun, lighthearted times, and they also have these really deep, emotional, like, little connections that just, like, wow. Because, yeah, it was mm -hmm. a happy story. Like, he did get to spend time with him, but it's like, wow. It could be a lot happier if you guys were there, you know, at the end. And they aren't. Yeah. And, but they are, you know, because they, they're they there at the final oh, yeah. shot. But, like... But that, that part is such a... that It's such a... It's such, like, a punch to the stomach because the, the speech he gives kind of seems like he's saying, even though all of these awful things have happened, I know there's still hope and this is a happy ending. But then he says... Well, I mean, like you said, when he says it could have been a lot happier, you suddenly realize, like, nope, this is a regular person. This is a regular kid who's, like, who just wants to see his family again. And that's so sad. That's so much more powerful than if he had just, than if he had just smiled and been like, well, everything's perfect now because we learned our lesson and we got to the end of the story and here is our moral. And instead he's just like, no, I'm a real person and I'm still sad. And like that hurts, you know, even though it is a happy ending and you do see, uh, you do see their spirits kind of, uh, uniting with him and kind of like 
showing that they're they're proud of him and they're still able to see him sometimes. So you do get that feeling of sat- uh, that satisfying ending, but at the same time, you still feel that loss and you still know that that is so tough to deal with. <laughs> um, when you were talking about uh, the the moments of the humorous moments combined with the more serious moments, um, one thing that I thought about while I was watching it this time was that the part of the film where all three main characters are traveling together is actually pretty short because they don't um there's a long there's a long beginning to the movie before monkey and beetle are even there um and then once kubo and monkey are together there's still a decent amount of time before they find beetle and then like before the ending they both die so there's kind of a pretty short span where all three of them are traveling together but it feels like you've known these three characters for years it feels like you've been on this long journey with them and you've gotten to experience so much and like you end up caring about them so much even though it's such a short time because all three of their personalities are so believable and interesting and fun and the way they slowly get to know each other and like each other more and eventually start to feel like a real family is so wonderful like just just how they go from kind of being like nervous and scared of each other to sort of irritated by each other <laughs> and sort of like casual annoyance <laughs> it's just so much fun um and then of course when they get to actually truly caring for each other that's really special too but i am i am so in love with how they sort of mess with each other and how they're just kind of annoyed sometimes <laughs> it's so funny um it's, uh particularly kubo and monkey because they they want to like they want the same thing they're definitely on the same side um monkey wants to keep kubo safe at all costs uh kubo cares about her uh doesn't know who she really is yet but he still thinks of her as a friend i think but all that said the way they just kind of antagonize each other is so funny it's so <laughs> it's good it's so good it's so so <laughs> funny and then once like, you get beetle into the mix yeah. and both beetle and kubo are annoying the mo- monkey so much yes. and like it's hilarious it's like uh oh, truly father and son it's just magnificent <laughs> It's hilarious. I love it so much. I love all the dynamics. And it's all, especially between the two of them and like all three of them. And the, it's all in these little moments, these little details that, that do like, even though it's not a long time that you see them all together, it feels like you, yeah, you've connected with them and you know them. And like, it's, it's so special and it's done so well. It's written so well. It's boarded and animated so well that it's just like, yeah, these are real characters and real people. I really quick want to talk about Kubo's power and his magical music and it's one of my favorite parts of the movie and that's why I was saying I really love the beginning of the film. I love the beginning um, showing Kubo and his mother and what their day-to-day lives are like um, and how his mother is kind of losing her memory and they and he has to really support her and like um, you know he goes to the village and he tells stories and then um, you know gets money from that like people will give him money for telling these stories and um, it's a good introduction to like his abilities as well and so he uses his instrument to play music and uh, causes these sheets of paper to fly out and cre- turn into origami and he uses these origami pe- paper to tell these epic stories that his mother is actually telling him and um and it's so so cool and i love that scene even though like you said there's like this whole big section before the you know conflict arrives you it's so so well crafted and so fun to watch that it's totally worth it and you don't even feel like it's slow in any way i think this the pacing of the film is brilliant so i just really love that it's kind of painful to watch Kubo kind of, he's kind of alone because even though he's with his mother, his mother isn't all there. And so he has to support her and do everything on his own. And it's a little bit sad, 
but um also like it's like they're together and you know they're doing okay and I just love his powers and I love his music and I love how that plays throughout the film with like the origami birds and then with the leaf boat like those are just such cool moments and I just like love every bit of it So I want to talk a little bit about the music because obviously it's a very big part of this movie and a big part of Kubo because he has this magical ability uh, through music. Um, But also because, Jamie, you're a musician and a composer and you probably have a better ear for it. (laughs) Well, you are. It's the (laughs) truth. Um, If you want to hear uh, Jamie's awesome compositions and also his awesome storytelling skills, listen to Night's Quest podcast. I'll put a link to it in the description. Oh, man. Of course. (laughs) It's it's hilarious, guys. But anyway, yeah, music is awesome and and very important to this film. Um, I don't know. what, What are your thoughts about the music and Kubo? Yeah, uh, I don't think, I don't think, um, I caught anything super surprising, like, oh, this song is secretly this other song. I don't think I caught anything quite like that this time. Um, the song that he is playing, it's partially his instrument and partially, you know, other background music, but the song during the first, like, when he's telling the story and the origami is happening and, um, he's telling the story to all these people, it's so interesting to see how the music is partially coming from this fight and it's partially literally him playing it um because they have to get a very specific tone of like the danger and excitement of this story and i feel like that's really tough to do when you are trying to tell one story of like an actual story that's happening in the past you're also trying to set the music for a current movie scene and on top of that, you're having a character in the scene playing music. And to, like, combine all of those things together is super difficult, I assume. And it was really cool to listen to, um, especially with, like, how it kind of rises and falls with what Kubo is saying. I think there's something, I don't know, I think there's something really special about that. The ending. I want to talk about the ending, and I promise that's the last thing. Because the ending is so fascinating to me. Um... I think what starts the whole ending sequence is when he has the whole dream with his grandpa, but the dream is so interesting because they make everything look like it's made out of that paper, and, like, even the the water and the waves are, like, little pieces of paper, these little squares that are all folded up, and it just looks so cool. We move, they move on to the, the whole thing with the fight and his parents die and then there's the very final confrontation where his grandpa just turns into a giant snake monster i love it i have no idea why but he just does and it's great um they have this whole thing they have this whole back and forth where their two ideals are obviously coming up against each other like we've already talked about with humanity versus this whole standard of like oh we're perfect immortal star beings and uh, Kubo is able to overcome that with the themes of this movie and, like, memories and real people and pain and things being difficult. But what's really particularly interesting to me, and I would love to get your thoughts on this, is at the end of that fight, uh, instead of dying, his grandpa suddenly appears, like, as a regular human, and he's got one of his eyes uh, blind like Kubo does, and he doesn't remember anything. And he's just like, I, I'm not sure where I am. I'm not sure who I am. I'm sorry. And yes. the people of the town start telling him, like, they start making stuff up. And they start talking about how everyone loves him. And he's this this well-respected person. And they all have little anecdotes. And they kind of come around him and, like, build him up and encourage him. And that is fascinating to me because I don't immediately know why they do it. I didn't have a great response for that, and I'm still so Mm -hmm. unsure about it because it was such an interesting decision, and I would love to hear what you have to say about that. Yeah, that's a really good point. I would say, well, first off, he becomes mortal through what 
what he defines as the mortal flaw of like seeing the love and kindness in right these villagers and he has one eye because i believe that the one eye he does have is kubo's other eye oh my goodness because he stole oh. his eye. Oh! Whoa. And it's the same. It's, oh, the, it's no. the left eye. <laughs> oh! Whoa! I did not think about that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, jeez. So, so his grandfather st- literally stole his eye. And so it's the left one. So oh, my, uh, that's what right, I believe. you Uh-huh. Wow. I forgot about that. Yeah. As far as the villagers, like, I just think they're all really good people. And, like, you know, it's, again, it's about, like, stories. And and if you're, you know, there's this frail old man and, like, it, it's clearly just, like, they're forgiving him and they are welcoming him and they are, you know, saving him from that pain. And then from a story standpoint, like, we already killed literally everyone else in his family. Like, literally <laughs> everyone else is dead. I'm sorry, we can't also kill his grandfather. Like, oh, I, I, no. that's not happening. Oh, that is... You're, I mean, you're absolutely right, but that's... <laughs> <laughs> I hadn't thought of it that way. Yikes. Uh, yeah, because his aunts are dead. His parents are yep. dead. Everyone yep. is dead. Like, his grandfather done messed up because he yeah. started this whole yeah. thing and now everyone is dead. Anyway, but but everyone forgave him, I guess. <laughs> There's so much. So everyone go watch the movie and let us know for yourself. Uh, we're on Instagram and Facebook at Fanimated Podcast. And you can email us at fanmatedpodcast at gmail.com. <laughs> Jamie, what have you been watching recently? Guess what? This is going to be very brief because the answer is the answer is nothing. <laughs> no, um, <laughs> what? um but like well, it's just that like unfortunately I haven't uh I haven't been into I haven't been watching anything super new. Um and to be mm-hmm. totally honest, I don't think I've watched anything at all recently, which is which I hate saying because like it makes my life sound so boring, but there's been like no, a lot of No, it sounds other like you're probably and, busy, yeah. yeah. So you haven't watched uh, the new episode of My Hero Academia? No, not yet. Are I'm you so, even caught I've, up? Ugh, no, I'm not. I'm so far behind on like everything, and I, I <laughs> it, it's so frustrating because I just want to, I want to watch everything, and instead of doing that, I watch nothing because there's so much. <laughs> it's, it's terrible i need to i need to get back on i have a list uh i have a list of things and i need to get back to it because i've been i've been putting it off and mm-hmm. i've been getting distracted by other stuff but my hero academia is definitely at the top of the list i still have to watch season three um and then obviously i have to start season four <laughs> <laughs> it's it's bad it's a mess i'm as far as pop culture goes, I'm miles behind most people I know, which is really unfortunate. <laughs> well, that's okay. It just means you're busy and you're doing yeah. other important things in your life, which is which is good. Kelly, what have you been watching recently? Well, I've been watching, um, again, I am also really busy, but I recently watched the uh, season finale of Miraculous Ladybug, and I know you don't watch that show, and not a lot of people do because it really is for <laughs> kids for sure. But like, I'm already too deeply invested, so I like yeah, have yeah. To watch all of them, and it's just it's a total train wreck. But I can't stop watching. Oh no! It. <laughs> okay, wait, wait. What does that mean? <laughs> oh man, it's just like this whole show. It's crazy because it's now it's like really popular, like all over the world. There's going to be a movie and all these things, which is great. Yeah, Um, yeah. But also like just the way the whole show started was bad. It was just abysmal. Oh, no. Um, But but they set (laughs) up this like love square thing that's happening and it's just at every single turn they put more stupid roadblocks 
You know, it's it's so <laughs> it's so like painfully obvious that the end goal is going to be these two people getting together, but you're just like right. you you have to sit through. They're just dragging you through the mud of like all the oh, things no. that could ever go wrong for them to not end up together. And the se- season finale ended with them both with other people, and you're just like, wait, what is happening? <laughs> And then Why also you you're you're a little bit just like wait a minute I think these new pairings are actually better than the than the original like end game. Oh no. <laughs> you know so now I'm like rethinking that can't everything be good. like uh can we just stick with what we got now instead of trying to like put these people together because it's just like they've been doing this for like three or four seasons and I'm just what? <laughs> Let's just end on something. Anyway. Oh boy. All right. Thanks so much, Jamie, for coming on the podcast and talking about Kubo and the two strings with me. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. This was a blast, and I can't wait to have you on the show again. Thanks. This was fun. Talk to you later. Bye, everybody. Bye. Thank you so much for joining us today. You can find out how to vote for upcoming episode topics by going to www.patreon.com slash fanimated. Let us know your thoughts on Kubo and the Two Strings and any of your other favorite animated media on Facebook and Instagram at Fanimated Podcast. You can also email us at fanimatedpodcast at gmail.com. The art for this podcast is done by myself. You can find me on Instagram at candordraw. The music was provided by Purple Planet Music and a huge thank you to Jamie for joining me today. Thanks again so much for listening and we look forward to talking to you soon. So stay tuned and stay animated. I especially really love when that that beginning scene with his mother and when he's a baby and there's this one, there's the one little part where his mother is like crawling through the sand to get to him. And just another one of those ways where all the little details make me so happy and just in awe. She's crawling through the sand and her hands like reach out and like dig into the, the sand and little grains of sand like come pop up and out you know, while she's gripping. And it just makes me, you know, they had to use wire to individually move those little pieces of sand. (laughs) Individually move grains of sand. (laughs) Yes. Isn't that bonkers? (laughs) (laughs) It's crazy, guys. I love this movie so much for so many reasons. (laughs) Ah.